are you doing? Welcome to uh, another installment of Untold Stories. This is um, technically number two in our series. Uh, number one was uh, supposed to happen next last Friday, excuse me, on Friday, um, but because of some uh, health issues, we weren't able to uh, get the speakers to come. So today, we're going to be uh, hearing from three local artists um, talking about artists of color and um, making art. Um, but before we begin, um, we're going to pause like we always do here and just acknowledge that the land that we're on prior to colonization uh, was the home of the sovereign people of the Squamish Nation. We give gratitude and thanks for their stewardship of the land and the waters that surround us and make summers here in the Pacific Northwest such an awesome place to be. Um, we acknowledge our history of colonialism and uh, we pay respect for, uh, to their elders, both past, present, and future, as they continue to safeguard the land and the waters and their cultural traditions for generations to come. Um, I want to thank uh, Quincy Blackman for uh, being our AV pilot today, and I want to thank all of you for coming out today. Um, we can't do programs like this at BIMA without your continued support, so uh, I hope to see you at a couple of the other ones that are coming up as well. Um, so today we're going to delve into some of the, the things that, well, we might not necessarily think about um, that artists of color are constantly needing to think about. Um, and we are very, very lucky today to have, we have uh, actually my friends here. Um, <laughs> Uh, who are doing very different things within the Seattle, within the Seattle area. Nikki Delora Barber um, is a printmaker, and she'll soon be featured as um, one of our artists in the Beacon Window out front sometime next year, I think. Um, she's also a fine art photographer and processor with the Davidson Gallery in Seattle. Uh, Karina Del Rosario uh, is a mixed media artist and whose passport series you might be familiar with. Um, she, it's been featured at the Ling Luke, excuse me, Ling Luke Museum and also at King Street Station. And she has two works, three works? Eight. Eight works, oh, okay. <laughs> a lot of work um, featured in our, in our Spotlight exhibition. So if you haven't checked that out yet, please make some time to see them. And finally, we have Tatiana Ganandia, uh, who's a painter and mixed media artist, uh, independent curator, and a longtime faculty at Seattle Central College, longtime colleague of mine. So please welcome them all. <laughs> so we're just gonna kind of have like a kind of maybe a little informal coffee discussion here. Um, and we'll see where the conversation takes us. We'll have some um, time for questions, or you know, if you have something that's really like totally on your mind at the moment, just we're small enough audience here where I think you can just raise your hand and shout it out for us. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. Um, it's, I'm really excited to see where, what we kind of unearth here. Um, so first, I just wanted to ask, how do you all identify um, and how does that impact your artistic practice? pronouns and I identify in the Northwest anyways as a white passing mixed race individual. Uh, my dad's side of family is all white, mostly Swedish, still immigrant. And then my mom's side of family is all Lebanese. My mom is second generation, I'm third generation. Uh, we were talking a little bit earlier so I think maybe I'll bring up that point now but um, it's interesting being in the Northwest where nobody knows what an Arab looks like. I promise you it's it's me, I look like an Arab. Um, but because of that, uh, I get to move into a lot of different spaces that most white people get to and don't really get to think twice about it. Um, and, you know, I was told at a very early age, I was in fifth grade when 9-11 happened, and so I was told by my mom not to tell anyone that I was Lebanese, so my access to Lebanese culture, um, my family stories about it were very much cut off. Uh, so that's been a big part of how I move forward through life. It's kind of an awkward feeling when I am around other Arabs who can speak Arabic and I have 
no access to that language. It's really difficult to learn too. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. And um, my name is Tatiana, and I was born in Cuba, so that's how I identify. I'm a political refugee. I came here as um, most other Cubans <laughs> um, as a result of the revolution. Um, and I grew up surrounded by my culture. I also grew up surrounded by um, Southern racism. And one of my first experiences in the US um, was being thrown out. I'm telling everybody here, being thrown out of a restaurant and being told, no dogs, no Cubans, no N-word allowed. And so that hierarchy was very clear. The dogs were superior, and then Latinos. I can't tell you how many times I was told to go back swim back to where I came from. And um, so I know that in the Pacific Northwest, I pass as white and I'm mixed race myself. My mother is European. She's Catalan and Romani. So she's also a little mixed. But um, in the East Coast, there's no question that I'm not white have been told to leave, have been told I'm not invited because I'm not white, so many times. And, you know, before we get too self-congratulatory about the Pacific Northwest, I'd like to say that just a few years ago, my husband and I were traveling uh, on a bus back from Portland, and I was speaking Spanish with the woman sitting next to me on the bus, and the bus driver um, said that we either had to stop speaking Spanish and you can see I'm not a loud speaking person. We, we had to stop speaking in Spanish or she was going to make us get out in the middle of the freeway and it was night and it was raining. It's a good thing my husband, who's sitting right here, um, put a stop to that, but I don't like the bus since. So I definitely identify as brown. Um, I am Filipina. I, my family immigrated uh, when I was six, uh, and I grew up in Los Angeles. Um, but we didn't really have any family around us uh, for a very long time. So um, even though my mom was very was working for the Philippine consulate, so we actually had access to other Filipinos. Um, you know, when you're six, you just well, when I when I was six, I just wanted to fit in. So um, yeah, it's it's you know been a, a lot of internal struggle with wanting to fit in, um, and the passport series that you mentioned, Ken, um, was actually you know kind of a result of just wanting to be seen as a human being too, um, because there are times when I am around Filipinos and I don't feel Filipino enough. Um, and so I kind of just feel most comfortable around a whole mix of people. Um, when I'm compelled to check a box, um, these days I, I will check Asian American and Latino because Philippines and Cuba and uh, many other, you know, Guam, um, Puerto Rico, it was all part of the Spanish American War. Um, and so culturally, after 400 years of Spanish occupation, I share a lot in common with, um, with Latino folks more so than East Asian um, cultures. Um, so my passport series was really this attempt to like let people identify in their own words what they want to be called what their memories are, what their sense of home is. Um, and yeah, I think it's it's hard. Like there's this cultural pride that I, you know, want want to hang on to and do hang on to, but then there are times when I don't feel like I have like full authentic knowledge, whatever that is. So within your identities, how does how do you feel this plays out in your artistic practice? Like, 
what does it give you? What does it, what it, does it limit you? Does it, um, how do you, do you incorporate all of this into the work that you make? Can we start with you, Tanya? Hi. So it's, it's a mixed bag for me because I identify as a visual union, so my primary interest in the studio is accessing archetypal imagery. And sometimes that intersects with my um, experiences and memories as a Cuban, as an immigrant. So I, for example, I worked in the migration series. I did installation, sculpture, photos, <laughs> drawings, painting, animations, films, all dealing with the archetype of the hangman. So the person who's suspended between spaces um, and um, the image of the hangman is based on pintura infamante, which is the idea of political punishment. So people being um, set up in the middle of the square as a political, um, somebody who's castigated, somebody who's punished. And that really keyed in with personal experiences because when I was six, I was in a camp for political, you know, I don't know how the Cuban government could justify putting six-year-olds in camps for political dissidents um, because my father was a dissident. Um, so in those cases, my work intersects specifically with my identity, but my interests are broader than my experience as a, as a Cuban. I also have a lot of interests in, I'm, I identify as she, her, and in my gender. Um, and so I do a great deal of work. Currently I'm working on an alchemical imagery using the bride, and it has to do with self-actualization, so the philosophical stone archetype. And it's completely embedded in my experience as a female. But there are other, there are many other archetypes that I've explored, and and this is this is where, and I don't know how you all feel, but that there is almost a pressure and expectation that if you are a person of color, that your work has to fit a certain look, you know, like what does Latina look like? What does Latinx work look like? So you know. How about you? And is there anything you want to expand on with with Tina and Tatiana? Um, now I finally turn it off. Okay, back on. Um, uh, yeah, I think um, it's funny. I was just submitting for this uh, public art call, uh, and the call was very specific to um, honoring the history of different communities in this neighborhood um, where the public art is gonna be. And so they specifically called out that they wanted Filipino artists. I'm like, oh, okay, great. And then I'm like, oh, what kind of, what, do, do I put a flag in? Like, you know, what am I, like how, how do I approach that in a way that doesn't feel yeah, like what, is it gonna look Filipino enough? So I'm like, you know, struggling with this uh, as I was writing it. Um, but I think in terms of like my, my past work and my current work, it's, I really try to explore just the human experience and ideas around or desi our desires to belong. Um, my piece is uh, in the Spotlight Exhibition. Um, it's called the Reconciliation Series. Um, and it's around forgiveness. Um, so it's really about just these human connections. That's what I'm drawn to the most. Sometimes it's um, political in nature, like the Passport Series um, that grew uh, over a long period of time. Um, and yeah, I think it's my own, you know, the, my own struggles with belonging that uh, weave into my work. Um, not necessarily strictly, you know, being Filipino, but just, you know, 
for, for our human condition. Thank you. How about you? Um, so I was born and raised in Bellingham, Washington. I'm sure many of you know it. Uh, and I felt growing up there, there was always this proximity to whiteness or this comparison to whiteness. Um, I think I was often considered uh, exotic is a word I heard a lot, or why do you look a certain way? Um, and so that's always, always in the back of my head of like, why am I not white enough? Or why am I not brown enough? Um, so there's this in-between realm that I've always existed in. I still feel like I exist in, but I'm owning that space more as I get older. But making work has never really felt like something that I've done in response to what others see me as, per se. It's more of a, I'm lucky. Uh, art has always been um, at the ready for me, like drawing, painting, carving, whatever, as an expression of how I feel. And so it's always kind of come through in symbolic terms. Um, you know, if something's a symbol and it's an expression of an emotion, it's not too scary for me. I can process it, I can deal with it. If it's on 2D, you know, format, it's outside of my head, it's outside of my body, it's okay, kind of thing. And so I think as a result of that, like I, I turned pretty early on to, you know, landscapes, flowers, portraits of myself. But a lot of people that find my work tend to be middle-aged white people. Um, <laughs> and I think they really respond to those things, which I find hilarious because, you know, it'd be something like a poppy, for example. And for me, when I was younger, it was always um, deeply symbolic of uh, a death, like a lot of violence has happened to me in my body. Um, I grew up in an abusive household, so it was not a pleasant thing to create a poppy. But then some like happy woman would just be like, it's so pretty, I love it, and like would buy it. And so I've never really felt pigeonholed into the, am I making like Lebanese work or am I making white people work? I've always kind of felt like I've avoided that a little bit. I think, I guess I'm pretty lucky, but um, lately, as in like the last five years, I've been starting to work a little bit less abstractly, a little bit more intentionally with the symbols that I choose and my own self-portraiture. Um, part of the work that's going to be shown at the, um, the window out there, which I'm very excited about, uh, is called the Wait, What Are You? series. Um, it's the question every mixed race person gets at some point in their life, and it sucks. Like, please don't ever ask someone, what are you? <laughs> wait. <laughs> yeah, wait, are you? <laughs> yeah. Um, and in it, I pull all these different symbols together and build self-portraits of me that's taken from different um, characters, from stories that I heard growing up constantly. And so um, the latest one that most of you have seen is called Shahrazad, the narrator from A Thousand and One Arabian Nights. And since then, I think I've started to get more requests for work that are more, I don't know, Arabic. And so I'm learning what that feels like now. And it's interesting because I don't come from a basis of already being put in that category. I'm feeling the pull into that category and I don't necessarily like it or dislike it, but it's moving. So it, it sounds, what I'm hearing from, from, from Karina and from, from Nikki and Han is that, that sometimes the, the space, that identity space, um, it's hard to negotiate because of, um, you know, you, because, well, you were explaining it as, as feeling not Filipino enough, right? And of being actively told to disavow certain parts of your, of your ethnicity. That, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd imagine that consciously or not, this is always kind of in, in the back of your mind when you're doing your work. Um, and I'm wondering, well, like, do you think that, that white artists need to do something like this as well? Um, <laughs> you know, do they experience things in this way or what? I have an observation. So, you know, Sean Pike, uh, just recently had the Artists of Color Expo Symposium, and, and they've been having ACES, and they've been having it for a few years now, and um, it's really a 
wonderful experience. Anybody who's a, an artist of color should go and participate, hear other speakers, see the work, and show your work with your fellow artists of color. But I, I want to just um, point out an observation from my first day. So it's going in and seeing all of the name tags. Um, and like I, I started to cry because I, <laughs> I saw all these names. And they were all recognizably people of color, people that I knew. And then, you know, of course, we had the exhibit. And um, there were some grants that were giving out so artists would present their work also to talk about it, like a mini lecture. And then right after that show, it was very demanding when we heard story after story. Um, very demanding because there's so much feeling, so much experience, so much pain, uh, so much exclusion, so many stories that went with that art and we were all bearing witness. And then from there I went to uh, an opening Incidentally, Aramis Lammer was in that show with me. We were, went to an opening uh, um, in West Seattle. She was fantastic, by the way. Yeah, yeah, amazing amazing work. Yeah. And the work there was completely different. And in conversation during the opening, Aramis said that she had, I was like, oh, I'm going to die. I'm passing out. It was so, so exhilarating, but so tiring to be present and to be aware, seeing, hearing, everything. And then she said, oh yeah, I, I just slept in the car in the parking lot before the opening. And here's the thing. I'm not saying that um, because all human beings, whatever their color, whatever their ethnicity, all human beings have common experiences that include pain, that include loneliness, that include exclusion. But in a white um, majority culture, the artist doesn't have to, but this very question that we're being asked and, and that we're examining tonight is not one that has to arise, right? It's a presumption that whatever culture they identify with is the culture that we're all aware of and we all understand because we all grew up with the same ads and the same foods and the same clothing that we're all wearing, same school systems, right? So there are these common grounds that we're excluded from. And so, I mean, I think when I take, for example, at Seattle Central, we have a very international um, student body and I take them to Seattle Art Museum and um, whenever they have the Robert Ryman painting, which is, you know, white on white, they're all like, Miss G, how is this even in a museum? And I'm like, well, you know, because they don't have to consider the history of uh, their grandpa being, you know, excluded, and their great grandma being uh, enslaved, and their parents being pursued, you know. They don't have to think about that. They can think about the poetry of white paint on white paint, which you and I never have the room to do. And so I think that that's a very basic difference between being an artist of color and I'm not saying that abstract artists and conceptual artists of color don't exist, of course not. That's not what I'm saying, but that it takes a real fortitude to be able to create that kind of space of, um, of unconcern for the histories that we are witness to, because it's not just a history that our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents have taught us and that we have experienced ourselves, but it's carried in our bodies. We have in our genes the memories of all those beatings, all you know, all those enslavements. So that's my that's my ramp. <laughs> um, so I was on the board with Seattle Printers with Ken here, and we during 2020 um, during the protests, a lot of conversations came up in board meetings that were deeply important and really useful. Uh, and we sort of collectively decided that we have a lot of members on our, in our community, printmaking community, Seattle printers, who are very white <laughs> and don't know how to have conversations about race or about what's happening 
um, in the city we live in and the community that they also share. So we did this uh, webinar series with group discussions following, um, and I pushed for talking about cultural appropriation because I felt like if we use the word race, white people go running, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we talked a lot about cultural appropriation and what I, what I learned through these um, four week series and meetings afterwards was that I think a lot of white people have never, much like Tatiana saying, have never thought about their own roots or where they're from or what's important to them or who they are really as people, not just what something's described to them as the quote unquote norm. Mm -hmm. um, what I found is that there were some people in the groups who were extremely resistant to talking about how they have completely sucked up and taken other cultures, symbolic, whatever, art forms, things, um, way of talking, speaking, behaving. Um, they just were so resistant to even admitting or thinking that they could have done anything quote unquote wrong. Um, there's no doubt about it. But for some people, they were so thirsty to have conversation around um, more in depth of who they were as people. And I found that to be useful for me to learn because I kind of just put in a lot of white people in the category of just colonizers, you frustrate me, I don't know how to behave around you. Like despite having colonizer blood in my own body, it just, I don't know, I just kind of dismissed. Um, but that wasn't appropriate for me, I think. And so I, I think it gave me some grace to think like, okay, you can be challenged. I don't need to do that like for you. <laughs> you can do it. So like, it was a need. It felt like. Mm -hmm. so. Renee, what are your thoughts? I see you thinking there. <laughs> um. Yeah, there are lots of thoughts kind of percolating. Uh, I think um, during. You know, I guess, so my, my background actually was originally in journalism. Um, and so storytelling is how I explain to people <laughs> my trajectory. It's like I, I wanted to tell more visual stories because the wor words were not enough for me at, up to a certain point. They're coming back to me, but... Um, <laughs> But uh, there, in, in my kind of trajectory of all the different jobs, I've had a lot of jobs, I still have a lot of jobs <laughs> because I'm an artist with several jobs. Um, and I think there are times when, you know, I'm in spaces where I feel like, you know, I'm supposed to speak into speak on you know these issues around diversity, inclusion, and equity, um, and that's great. Uh, and then there are times when I just kind of need a break from it. You know, like I, it's it's heavy. Like what you were saying, it's exhausting. It's exhausting to to think about to hold space for other people to hold space for myself. Uh, and I think because I've, you know, in the spaces that I'm also an educator, um, teaching not only other adults, but also uh, also children. Um, yeah, sometimes I, I just get tired of, I, I kind of lose my own, I have to ask myself, like, how, how do I actually feel? Because I'm like trying to, um, trying to support other people through their own processes in, you know, it, in whatever that looks like. And then sometimes it's like, yo, somebody else take this. <laughs> you know, I need to pass on this one right now. Um, but it's hard, you know, it's a, yeah. And I think sometimes there are, you know, I have, uh, my, my husband is, is white. I have a lot of white friends who are all, you know, very, they're, they, they're doing work. Um, and sometimes I just want, I have turned to my white friends, I'm like, can you take this? Because I, you know, take this, take, take your people. <laughs> you know, like, have this conversation with them because it can't come from me. <laughs> I don't have it in me. 
Um, and you know, great, I'm grateful that they do. Um, but yeah, it's just it's hard. It's exhausting. And I just want to take a nap sometimes. <laughs> I just want to say, like, I really appreciate you saying that so much. Like, I love that you are getting, you're saying that you need to respect your own energy stores and systems, and I think that's super important. And also that I think we're really touching our love. Like, people also need to take accountability for their own labor that they are demanding of people of color constantly. So thank you for saying that. One of the themes that keeps coming up with with all of you is just kind of like that 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 tension between identity making and um, public consumption, I guess, and some of the ways that that, um, that you notice how your practice differs from you know, folks who don't have to think about some of these issues. Um, have, have any of you ever had the experience of, of uh, someone telling you, wow, you're kind of lucky that <laughs> <laughs> that you have all these things to draw upon. And how did that land for you? Um, I try to be honest, I try to be vulnerable in my communications and my posts, verbal, in person, online, it doesn't matter um, what you see is basically what you get. But yeah, I often get people saying like, wow, like you're, you're doing the thing, you are so lucky. And it's not, I think we were getting that like, oh, all these like traumas that we've experienced. So, you know, I think it's just so frustrating when <laughs> it does happen though, because I'm like, you have no idea like how much this hurts on a daily basis. Like I go to therapy weekly and I have been for six years and that is something like I can't afford but I make it happen because it's that important to me. And like um, I hear people say like, wow, but you're so gifted with um, being able to talk about these things that have happened to you or these experiences that shaped who you are. And like I am not sharing all the terrible things that come along with that. Like my disconnection with my family, um, which came first, the chicken or the egg, all the racism that happened um, when we got here, or, you know, <laughs> like, just existing in America in the first place, like, I don't even know how to explain all of the things that trickle down from your bloodline and ended up with me. Um, and so when people come to me, it's like, wow, I'm, I'm so excited for all the things you get to do and you're so lucky that you have so much to talk about. Um, I feel like it's this complete dismissal of who I am as a person and who my community is, and also kind of dismisses their own actions and life, so to speak. Like they're, they're seeing my life and things they choose to see through it, but they're dismissing that they could also make decisions and choices to get to where they want to be um, and not acknowledging all the different struggles that I've been through. So I know it's kind of a long way to get there, but long story short, I find it very upsetting. <laughs> Super upsetting. Well, I would say that um, it's not just um, dismissing, but that it is diminishing mm -hmm. as well. Um, it doesn't acknowledge because you're talking about going to therapy, so that's a lot of um, hard work. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's a lot of hard work. work. <laughs> right. <clears throat> it doesn't acknowledge all the hard work that happens in the studio. Yeah. And when we're educators, it doesn't acknowledge all the hard work that goes in preparing for lessons and all the hard work that goes in interacting and being present for others and helping to pull out from them the same amount of or uh, the beginnings of that hard work. Because if you have something to express, it's because you work at it. <laughs> because you're a human being like everybody else. Um, so it is definitely something that um, hurts me. And, and something that I think that goes with that 
Um, and, and I'm wondering, because of this, like, sometimes we get opportunities, um, like a speaking opportunity, because we are people of color, or we're of this ethnicity, or that one. Um, and then there are those who will look at that and go, like, well, but that's how you got it, you know? Because, so you're lucky, right? You, it's not just that you have something to say, good for all your experiences, but it's also that you are given this opportunity. And, um, oh, that makes me so mad. <laughs> and, you know, after we hear from Karina, I hope, um, I would love to share some images that really kind of... I love that question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think because, you know, in... So one of the things that I did back in 2010, 2011, um, when I was first starting to um, consider, oops, sorry, consider myself as an artist and trying to support other people's work, I, I uh, reached out to other friends. Um, this was pre-Shun uh, Pike storefronts. This was, you know, back in, around that time, there were a lot of um, empty storefronts in the International District. Um, and so some of the nonprofits there were experiment, a nonprofit um, community development association was experimenting with activating those storefront spaces. Um, so I reached out to folks to say, would anybody be interested, you know, to be part of an artist of color collective? We don't want to just say artists of color, but like artists of color and people who explore identity in their work. Um, and so we, you know, we were able to um, occupy a space for a year and show show work. Um, we had guest curators, um, and were part of this lineage. There were people in the '60s who did the same thing in the in the ID. Um, and I feel like we were able to um, really push with uh, for culture, with um, uh, Office of Arts and Culture, and just you know re raise the the need for um, spaces for artists of color to show their work um, because there wasn't really a lot of gallery representation or museum um, representation at the time, and I feel like these collective efforts have um, helped, you know, little by little create this momentum. Um, and there is this time now when we're having major shows at museums featuring solo shows of artists of color. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, what do you call that? It's it's the mode of the time, right? It's yeah, the time. yeah. Um, and you know, and and there's you know, like oh, social justice. Oh, that's a thing. I'm like, mm, yes, <laughs> it's been. You know, these struggles have been uh, ongoing, and so there's this. Sometimes I, I did overhear this this person who, um, you know, who I know and I'm friends with, I overheard her say something like, to what you were, you were saying earlier, it's like, oh yeah, you know, so-and-so, they, they're getting all the shows, you know, they, uh, they're just not interested in, you know, this abstract art that, that she creates, because it doesn't, it doesn't address any so, sort of social justice issue. And, you know, it's like hearing her disappointment that, you know, nobody's interested in that anymore or whatever, or for the time, I'm like, well, don't you worry, it'll, it'll come up again, you know, like this, this might just pass because people don't want to, and yeah, I, I'm struggling with, um, to be articulate about it because it's just something, you know, having worked as a journalist on these social issues for so long, and then to see more and more people pay attention to it, but then also know, know, knowing that people are also fatigued by it. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how long you know, it'll 
glass uh, and whether any movement will actually be made. Um, hopefully, incrementally, I want to be hopeful because I'm an optimistic person, but it's just, um, you know, not all calls for art or public art will be specified for Filipinos or other ethnicities. That's like very, that's a very slim moment in time. One of the other things that we may have touched a little bit on, but really haven't talked about expressly, so all of you are women of color, you know, making art. Um, and I, I want to, Let's get to take a look at like identity. It's so complicated, and and do other intersectionalities come into play for you when you're thinking about the work that you're making? And if so, um, do you think you have a like a conscious hierarchy of like engagement points um, within those intersectionalities? personal practice, uh, gender is very important. But I think that it's important on a number of levels, and it's not just for my personal practice. So I, I have these little infographics. This one's from the National Museum of Women in the Arts. The others come from the Mellon Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Burns Halpern Report. So from 2020, this is from 2018, but the other ones that we'll look at are research from 2022 and 2023. So I'm talking about the things that are happening now. So 87% of work in collections in the US in museums are by male artists. And 85% of those are white. So yeah, there's that intersection. It absolutely gender whether I'm painting boobs or not. <laughs> Gender is a part of my work because whether or not it gets shown in a museum and gets collected in a museum is very much dependent on this. Um, can we see the next one? So race, ethnicity, I, I love this little pie. Um, this one is um, from Williams College. They looked at 45,000 responses. 85.4% of the works in all major US museums, as we saw, are by um, white artists and male artists. And I, I want you to look at what we see. So there's that big pie, 80% is white. Now remember, gender is subsumed here. It's not aggregated, right, or disaggregated. We have Latinos are 4.4, black, 5.9, Asian 7.9, Middle Eastern, oh, we sorry. Made it. We made yeah, it. like 1% South Asian, 0.2% Pacific Islander, 0.2% Native American, 0.1%. It's a good thing that we acknowledge we're on their land. Um, not in the museums, though, not in the collections. Can we go to the next one? And so here's the realities of the Burns Halperin report. So in the US, 50% of the population are female, 13.6% are black Americans, 6.6% are black American women. But if we look at representation in terms of shows, so like you're talking about, Karina, how you know somebody's being shown and getting recognition and others are like, oh, but my work isn't seen because my work isn't socially. So there's a discrepancy between what we perceive because we're all, we're all like, oh yeah, black lives matter. Yeah, me too. Time for social justice. We see a show here, a show there, something collected here, something collected there, and we think that we're making major change. But if we're looking at the actual numbers, you can see, look at the proportion of black American women in museums, it's 0.5%. That's, that's something to cry about. You know, there's a reason Aaron has fell asleep in the car. <laughs> you know, like when you see numbers and you hear the stories, it absolutely devastates and guts you. Can we look at the other one? This is, I apologize, I don't want to bore anybody, but this is, 
this is the teacher in me, the educator in me. I just wanted to share these with you. Um, so between 2008 and 2020, just 11% of acquisitions at U.S. museums were worked by female-identifying artists, and only 2.2% were by black American artists. But you know, we're like so excited that we showed Kehinde Wani in town. You know, I mean, my eyeballs fell out, <laughs> right? But let's keep it up. Let yeah, let's keep it up and let's and let's recognize that the rest of the year it's not right. And let's look at the next one. So this one I I added today. This is from the Mellon Foundation survey of 2022. They looked again at, at museums. And women may be underrepresented in what museums collect and show, but they're not underrepresented in employment. And here's where, you know, because just because we are here, we're all women of color, and we're doing the work, right? We're doing the work in the studio, we're doing the work in our communities, we're doing the work here tonight. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that just because there's a woman or a person of color in a museum does not necessarily mean that they are going to be putting their neck out for you, right? So I just thought it was very interesting. There's a little bit of nod bar there right now in the largest museums. It's not even represented in our smallest museum. So you can see non-binary, male, and female. So you can see that there's actually more women working in museums than men. But we're showing and collecting men. And I think the last one is this one. And this one, um, I think it's really interesting because it compares from 2015 to 2022. Um, and so you can see that there's a gap between perception and actuality. So one of the things that's really interesting is that people of color, for example, in 2022 comprise 47%, which is our largest, right? 47% of the people employed in a museum. They're in building operations. You know what that means? That means we make good janitors. That's what that means, right? So what they're finding is that there is an increase of people of color being employed in museums, but that the majority of those employment opportunities are people-facing, and they're the lowest paid. So people-facing, <laughs> we're facing the people, we're the lowest paid, right? So I say this because this is also a part of what happens in our studio. Like we may not, we, we don't necessarily need to be looking at these numbers on a daily basis because, you know, there's learned optimism and there's learned pessimism, you know, and then you just don't try because you're like, well, why should I bother? You know, I, mean, I didn't try for this show. <laughs> right, so, but the numbers are real. It's not your imagination. So if you're not, if you're an artist of color here today and you find that you're not having the traction or you're a culture worker and you're finding that you're not getting the traction, come measure it with the work that you're putting in. There's a reason and the reason is external. And some of that it could also translate to internal reasons where you burn out, right? Taking this is like what you were saying about, you know, like it's good to know those boundaries and to pass it along and to protect your energy because it is exhausting and it is debilitating psychologically, not just economically. a little bit on the intersectionality component, just a little bit, um, and how it affects my work constantly. Um, I do have, I'm, I'm gay, for starters, and so that translates into a lot of my work, whether I'm thinking about it or not, um, just how I see 
other people, um, how to relate to them. There's a heteronormativity that exists in the world that like doesn't necessarily sit well with me and has always come through my work whether I was openly out or not. <laughs> so um, that constantly is out of play. I also was raised in a you know blue collar family too and so there's also this intersection of class that comes into a lot of my work. I think it's why I enjoy print making so much is because it's this beautiful blend of commercial output with fine art and you really can't stick your nose up too high in the air because someone who's a painter probably is going to get on you for it. Um, and I like that. I like existing in that space where I'm aware of um, lots of different classes and whatnot. Um, yeah, and then just being a woman, like I mentioned earlier, like, well, if I want something done to my body, um, and it's hard to sort out, like, is it because I looked exotic? Is it because I'm a woman? Is it because I was in the wrong place? And I, I spent a lot of emotional labor trying to figure out those things because that's what you do when you have no control in your life. You try to figure out a way to feel control. Um, I do not feel that way as much anymore, but it still comes through in my work a lot. And I think one thing that question is probably getting at that I will say is um, it doesn't really matter um, all the different things that are happening to me. Like it comes through in the work no matter what. Like I'm constantly dealing with it. It doesn't just go into a little box and, you know, I think about white paint on white canvas. Like I've never, <laughs> I've never been in that position. So. And I like your slides. I like numbers once in a while. <laughs> we are running out of time, but I want to give some time for, for questions to the, to the audience. So first I wanted to say some appreciation for some of the things Tatiana said, uh, particularly in statistics, which speak to my experience. Um, oh boy. Um, my question is about at what point all of you felt like you got access or permission to participate in the professional art world. And the context for my question is that without being too biographical, I tried to have an art career in my 20s, and what I found is it's got nothing to do with the art that I produce. It has to do with whether I can curry favor with some like white hipster with a trust fund who has a loft. Um, the same thing in the film world. So I gave up, and I took a corporate job, and I've been doing that for a long time, and I recently quit, and I'm trying to make art again. And it's the same thing. Like I'm literally on a board giving out grants, and I'm the only person of color and totally invisible. And I don't present as what I think a like majority dominated setting would want from a person of my ethnicity. Um, so even if there is like a we want South Asian artists, is they don't want me. They want like an Indian girl who knows where I'm gonna start. Um, and I found this to, it's it's frustrating enough that I think I'm gonna take my art to my grave, honestly. Um, What's your name? Neil. Neil. Yeah. What's your last name? Oh, Patel. Neil Patel? Yeah. It's nice to meet you. My name is Nikki Jabora Barber. Uh, you know me. We're now connected. I hope you use that connection. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Let me give you my card. Let me give you my card. Oh, wow. Thank you. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I want to say um, that becoming a part of um, Artist Trust is a great place to start. I think COCA also is another great place to start. Um, so becoming a member of two organizations that cater to emerging artists, which could be of any age, because <laughs> I, I just turned 62, so let's not even go into the ageism bit, right? So, but I I hear you, and I'm, I'm really sorry that you suffered attrition, that your creative voice, this is, this. This could warrant another conversation that has to do with different ways in which we suffer censorship. Because there's a censorship that happens at the gallery, there's a censorship that happens when you apply for things and are dismissed, and then there's a and, and then the censorship that happens of our own in our own minds and in our own hearts when you try so hard and you get no traction, and then you just quit because it's learned hopelessness, it's learned pessimism, it's like, why bother? Um, and so, you're not alone, you're not alone. Um, and now you know some. And now you also know that this is an organization that cares and has community 
outreach. Take advantage of that. Over to um, Specific to, I think your question was, um, or was around access. Um, it's really other artists of color who held doors open for me. Um, both as a teaching artist and as an artist. And um, I would gladly share my contact information with you as well. Um, and I feel like uh, so much intense gratitude for the friends that I have known along the way who um, have really mentored me. I mean, I don't have formal art training. You know, I didn't, I don't, I don't have an MFA. Every time I think, every time I think about applying to grad school, I'm like, oh, I can't get into debt. It only goes like, it's, it's, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is what I've, I've been told. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also at my age, I came into visual art um, after, um, yeah, having, you know, a couple of decades working in the nonprofit world. I seem to um, be going backwards in terms of my income, <laughs> you know, going from like relatively okay nonprofit salary to, you know, being back as a gig worker, but I couldn't be any happier. Um, but it is, uh, I was just reading an article on August Wilson, um, and I don't think that, that um, what I appreciated about this article was that he tried, he submitted to, I guess, this Eugene O'Neill uh, workshop stage like five times to try to get in, right? And then he finally got in on that fifth try, and that's when he was able to workshop fences. And it's, it's brutal. It's brutal because you put so much of your heart out there um, and to get rejection after rejection, I mean, yeah, it's it's discouraging, but don't you know? Keep at it anyway. You know, now that you're now that you're back you're back in, you're in. We're gonna help you along. I will say to you, um, I love a big chocolate rejection letters because I keep all of mine. Um, I keep them all because I love some of them are so funny too. Like you get one that's like your work just didn't fit our show, and you're like, okay. But some are like pick apart my piece so like diligently that I'm like, wow, you must have either really loved it or really hated it. Like I don't know, but I keep them all because they remind me that um, I don't know, just the other side of the spectrum because I do accept it into things now. Um, because I'm stubborn as hell, um, but because of my community, like Rebecca McDonald right there, has always supported me and loves me very much. I wouldn't be here without her. Um, you know, it's the people that are close to you and who see you, and it's like friends, and it's my, for me, my chosen family. Um, it's, I would never, ever devalue like a friend buying some artwork for me. Like to me, that's success. You know, so it's like those little things too. It's, it is like learned helplessness and it is learned positivity or negativity, but it's also, I think, I don't know, I'm kind of stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I want to do, I'm going to do it. You know, and I feel like every single person in my childhood life told me not to, but that's just me. I'm like, no, excuse me, but fuck you. <laughs> like, absolutely, we're do whatever I want. <laughs> and it's going to be hard and we're going to be okay because we support each other. Like, you know, freedom. Mine was about the numbers on the chart. It was about, you know, the ethnicity and white or black uh, for the don for the collections. And I was thinking, where are the collections coming from? Are they donations? Are they coming from white male, rich white males? So this is their collections that they are donating to the museum. So how do we change that? How do we empower curators? And you know, to be able to go out and 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 buy great art yes. by people of color, by whoever's doing great art. Well, it's a complicated it's a complicated yes. issue. I heard um, Teresita Fernandez speaking about this, and she said, um, "Power is taken; it's never given freely." 
And in order for us to have a seat at the table, somebody has to get up and go. Be kicked out or graciously get up and say, well, my time is over and now it's your turn. And so the thing is to uh, encourage museums to change their board members, to include artists of color and maybe not everyone who has, you know, a giant bank account because there's different ways to mark value, Yeah, you know, and artists bring, and culture workers bring a different kind of capital to the museum. We bring cultural capital. If you're interested in hearing more about this topic, actually it's gonna be up the, the topic of our next Untold Stories on the 22nd, we'll be welcoming Elisha Johnson and uh, Eileen Jimenez, who were jur- judges for our uh, Spotlight show. And they're gonna talk about like, well, the power of curators, the power of judges, the power of, and the influence that they have on uh, artists' careers, particularly about artists of color. Um, and uh, that's gonna be Wednesday? Tuesday. 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 Tues